Kubel's Cat and this is Lecture 4 of the great course on disaster preparedness, When Everything Fails. Lecture 4 is about making decisions in a crisis, before, during and after, and it's really valuable. Lots of deep little information, I try to capture the important stuff from the course on here, but I am going to interject quite a bit. This might run on a bit, so if you haven't at this point, grab a vegan snack and a coffee, settle back, relax, open up your preparedness journal, and make notes. We have discussed actions that you can take to prepare for the next disaster. Whatever it may be, drawing up on some guidance offered by the professional emergency management community. Now, I want to step back from that a bit, take a pause, and ask this question. How should we think about decision making in disaster situations? For me, one of the main faults I find with preppers online is they always view themselves as the leader. The truth is I've been in managerial positions and in leadership positions and it's not the same thing for most of my working life, which is now happily ended. The hard truth is leadership in SHCF will be the same as leadership now. If, like most people, you're a follower and not a leader, it is very probable, in my opinion, that you will also be a follower in a disaster. Now, that being said, People are leaders and followers in a flexible manner, depending on what's going on for different things. Now, the idea of the general in charge of the troops of the bug out group um, is a common trope online, and I think it's a disastrous one. I don't actually think military structure translates 100% to civilian structure. You've got to have some discussion. You've got to have some leaders and some followers and some flexibility. You've got to have mutual listening and mutual trust and mutual decision making but decisions have to be made so let's make some this is a key point for disaster preparedness once you've gone through the preparedness cycle that is developed a plan obtained supplies become educated on how to use them and practice here's what we haven't yet addressed your readiness to approach an actual disaster situation while i hope you never have to and to provide the leadership and effective decision making in the midst of that disaster that can help you and others remain safe. If you accept that you should help, and if you accept that you need others to help, then yes, you're gonna to have to make decisions. You don't have to do any of that. You can just stay away from whatever's unfolding and do your own thing. It depends. Be very, very longitudinal in your thought process here. Don't just deal with what you're looking at. Think about the implications in the short, medium, and long term of what's gonna happen subsequent to this event. But if you can, get in there and help. In this session, we will discuss what research tells us about how people actually behave in disasters compared to some less than accurate myths. Good. Reality over entertainment is badly needed in online prepping. He's going to use the sort of decision-making model. There are other ones. I would encourage you to look at the different types and find one that actually works well for you. Sort works well for him. Doesn't mean it'll work well for you or for me. That's S for size up, O for objectives, R for respond safely, and T for think carefully. The timing and order of all of this stuff will, I guarantee you, vary. But whatever you use, what you need to be doing is think before acting, be able to act effectively, alter how you're acting based on evaluation ongoing, and then reevaluate at the end and recover from and plan to think about the next one. And of course, they all want you to do it safely. Nothing is perfect, and disasters are frequently accompanied by emotions such as fear, a desire for urgent action, and incomplete information. However, the SWORD model can help in identifying some best practices that can promote effective decision making and responses. Anything that focuses, calms, and helps you make rational decisions in a crisis is great. There are thousands of models. Find one but be aware of the others. You may want to merge a couple of types together. No one type will fit all of the scenarios. There always will be room to change things and to look at things from a different perspective. You are not him, you are not me, you are you. Don't be stuck using other people's methods and other people's ideology. Use it if it works. Use part of it if it works. Reject all or part of it if it doesn't fit for you. On January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport in New York City, heading for Charlotte, North Carolina. 
The flight crew, Captain Chesley Sullenberger and First Officer Jeffrey Skiles, piloted the aircraft over the New York City skyline when suddenly and unexpectedly there was a bird strike less than two minutes into the flight, which resulted in the aircraft losing power in both engines. PSA for those with aviotropia, modern aircraft do not carry parachutes. The subsequent exchanges between Captain Sullenberger and air traffic control revealed a dire situation as options for returning to an airport, any airport, were progressively ruled out. The aircraft had no engine power, was only moments after takeoff, was nowhere close to full altitude, and was still in its initial climb. The only viable option was to land the aircraft in the Hudson River, which Captain Sullenberger did masterfully, saving the lives of all passengers and crew on board. The only notice to the passengers of what was happening, other than their own observations of the aircraft clearly losing altitude, was the captain's announcement over the public address system to brace for impact and the flight attendant's instructions to do so. When the aircraft landed in the river, it was evacuated quickly. Captain Sullenberger walked the center aisle twice to make sure no one was left behind. And as soon as the plane made its emergency landing, boats were already heading in its direction to assist with rescue operations and all persons had been picked up within 20 minutes. What can we learn about crisis decision-making from this incident? Time may not be available to make decisions. Help may not be available in the time required. But acting, generally speaking, based on prior thinking, prior knowledge, prior training, generally speaking, will work, providing you are acting without being tunnel visioned. Stay calm, stay focused, trust everyone. If you delegate it, it's gone, it's their issue. You do what you need to do. Don't be micromanaging. You don't have the time, nor do you have the resources to do this in a disaster. You have to assume that people with a little bit of correction every so often will work to the plan, and the plan will be something that you tell people over and over. Of course, he means use the SART model. There are other models. I think there are several things. The first is something that we can actually hear from the recorded transmissions prior to landing. The flight crew and air traffic controllers were in control, reviewing information as it was known and maintaining a calm and collected demeanor. Looking at the passengers, while the urgency of the situation was clear, there was minimal panic. There was altruism. Passengers assisted one another and bystanders in the form of boats and ferry pilots rushed to the scene to help. This tells us something about how people tend to behave in a crisis and it's generally positive. Having been the incident commander at quite a few hospital-based and community-based disasters in Toronto, I can tell you that the leader has to be very calm and focused and open to all information. This can be straightforward, it could be individual, it can be huge. Like somebody needs to go, you know what, close this road now because it's not safe. People are hesitant to make macro decisions outside of their norm. Somebody that comes along and is quite able to make them, you'd be surprised. Everybody will scurry around and close that road for you. But you have to be calm and you have to continually think what's going on. And if you really are stuck between two, a rock and a hard place, you don't know what to do, ask everybody to say, you know what, I think we should close this road right now because of that. But if we close this road, how can people get to the emergency department? And somebody might say to you, oh, we can open up that road down there that goes to the park, we just call the park authority and they open it for us. Problem solved. I, as the leader, may not know that the park authority can open the park and have traffic through Sunnybrook Park into Sunnybrook's back way. Didn't know they could do that. Well, they can do that. So it's something people are aware of that aren't necessarily going to be the leaders. Listen to everybody, ask everybody when you have the time to do so. Public behavior in a disaster is usually good. Numerous research studies have confirmed this finding. Sadly, time after time, government reacts to individuals and local groups supplanting organized government, because organized government's been washed or burned or destroyed away by banning and trying to control those local efforts. The latest example of this was the BC floods when they banned river traffic from the Fraser River because it wasn't safe. Yeah, it's not safe. There's trees in the water, all sorts of problems down. But the locals who were using the boats were actually evacuating people out of Hope, a town that was totally cut off, and bringing food and water into Hope, a town that was totally cut off and didn't have any food or water. At the time of banning this naval response from the locals, there was nothing to supplant it. 
There's nothing to take over. The focus of the government often will be to re-establish control, not necessarily to actually help the situation, at least in the short term. Now, when you study it, almost all disasters and catastrophes show this pattern. It is not, please don't bore me in the comment section, a left or a right wing political thing. Power corroded and removed suddenly, always generally speaking, reacts by trying to reassert itself, often in ways that are not helpful to preserving life and improving short term disaster response. This happened in 9-11. They were bringing tons and tons of food in to feed everybody. Tons by the end of it. Government banned it. They didn't like it. They don't like people to do things outside of government control, especially in disasters. And there's good reasons for that. But be aware of the fact if you are establishing a localised response to a disaster, somebody from the government might show up eventually and they might tell you to stop. Are you going to stop? I wouldn't, but you might have to. Disaster movies, as much as we may enjoy them, and some media reporting patterns may suggest the opposite, implying widespread panic and deviant public behaviors. Many prepper channels also take this view. History says that it's not so. Some preppers need to read history. Some preppers need to learn to read. The word panic gets thrown around quite a bit and without a lot of meaning to explain what panic actually is or what it looks like. Unfortunately, this means that behaviors that are perfectly rational may incorrectly be labeled as panic. I remember watching a news story about a store where there was an explosion due to a gas main leak. The news footage showed people running from the store going in different directions once outside, but all focused on getting out of the store. The reporter explained that the images showed the public panicking, but as far as I was concerned, I saw something very logical. There had been an explosion at the building and people were running away from it. Other factors can also affect the way we view disasters and our responses. In many disasters and catastrophes, water is absolutely critical. Fresh, clean, safe water is critical very early on. And time and time again, white people who find bread and water find it. And black people that get bread and water have looted it. The truth is, if the stores are overwhelmed or whatever, and there's a huge disaster going on, all of that stuff's going to be insured. And most of the store owners, if they were there, actually mostly hand the stuff for free to people. And mostly people, once they've recovered, go back to those stores and give them money. It's not a black and white issue. However, the lens can see that as a problem. Different response required if you see lots of black people stealing water from stores, compared to if you see a lot of white people helping themselves by finding fresh water and handing it out to others in the area. It's got to be very critical how you view the world in terms of the result of response that's going to be inflicted, and it's often inflicted on the people who've already suffered a disaster. Panic does sometimes occur, but when it does, it's because people perceive that their ability to escape is closing. And in those circumstances, you may see disorderly evacuations, people pushing and shoving others out of the way, even leaving loved ones behind. But this is far more the rare exception than the rule. Know the exits, know how to exit, and exit as soon as there's trouble. Do not wait. If you actually leave with the mass of people, that's when you're going to find trouble. Generally speaking, it's not a big deal to get off a subway, it's not a big deal to get out of a cinema, and then go back in. During these events, have breathing exercises, deep breathing, slow breathing exercises that you have trained to do so you can artificially calm your heart rate down so you can think with your logical mind, not with your lizard mind. There is a time and a place where you don't want to be cognitive at all. You just want to do stuff to escape. Generally speaking, those are really, really near-death experiences, and that's just going to kick in. The idea of panic with an irrational public response or one where persons act in a self-centered manner with disregard to others is not only unlikely, but is also contrary to the strong sense of altruism that often accompanies a disaster situation. Preppers who think hordes of people are coming out of the cities for them and their stuff, preppers that think the government's coming for them and their stuff, they really need to have a good hard think about where that is coming from, what the implications that are, and I would suggest they probably need quite a bit of therapy. One common belief is that in a disaster, people just freeze and become unable to function because they don't know what to do. This has been called the disaster syndrome. 
And again, this is very rare. And when it does occur, it tends to be associated with witnessing significant physical trauma to a person or significant destruction of a building. As we saw in the Miracle on the Hudson, a large-scale rescue effort emerged before a formal incident response had even been established. This is called emergent behavior. As the public looks for new ways, separate from their ordinary day-to-day -day activities, to be of help. This is very common and very helpful. Consider how you and your preps could help with emergent behaviors in a disaster in your localized area. Now, I'm not saying if there's a nuclear war between China and Russia and America and everything, all the bombs are in, it's terrible, that you should crank out your tins of rice and help out. I wouldn't. But if it's a major snowstorm, can you actually hand out some blankets? Can you actually hand out some old sleeping bags? Can you actually make soup at the side of the road to feed the hydro crews as they come down and make coffee with the huge amounts of stale coffee you have? What can you do to help the situation safely? Consider how New Yorkers came together on and after September 11, 2001. The heroes of Flight 93 who made the decision to fight back against the terrorists on the same day. The members of the Cajun Navy who used their personal boats to rescue people in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina and have since deployed to other hurricanes. In fact, in any disaster, the absence of local non-government organizations and individuals helping is pretty much zero. People do help. Local organizations switch to emergent help mode. What can you do to help is an emergency preparedness question. As a prepper, I would ask first, is it safe for me now and ongoing to help? And then I switch to emergency preparedness mode and I would help. But I wouldn't necessarily always help. Could it be situational? Size up, objectives, respond safely, and think carefully. When responders arrive on a scene, their first step is to quickly assess what's going on. But if some aspects of the classic W and H questions can be identified, that's who, what, when, where, why, and how, that can help guide decision making. I'm also going to add one more to that list, impact on persons and places, to provide a full picture of the situation. This is often done quickly, but a sampling of the type of questions that may be asked follows. What? What exactly is happening? What do you see? Look carefully getting a 360 degree perspective if you can. What threats can you identify? What are the weather conditions? Is there any damage? Are there any injuries? What resources are available? Where is the incident location? Is it small and localized or so large that the entire area, a neighborhood, maybe a full city or county is impacted? Are there any safe spaces within the area or is the entire space at risk? Do you need to move from one place to another? And if so, is the area passable? The question of why may or may not be relevant. If it's an anguished yell, why is this happening, expressed from frustration, then it's perhaps a question better to consider later. Now, I would say that focusing too much on why is a really bad idea. For example, in COVID-19, and the good lords, they're still doing it. They're still focusing on why and who. Didn't help with their mitigation, their preparedness, or their response at all to COVID-19 pandemic. But it's a good distraction. It's a good distraction from dealing with the pandemic. It's a good distraction from actually being a prepper. Who is affected? How many people? Do they have any special needs? Is there a need for any kind of emergency care, sheltering, or life necessities? And I would argue if you have a decent you know, disaster plan going into this type of event, the answers to most of this stuff, if not all of it, is actually already known to you. And that, again, really helps confidence and really helps ability to respond to a disaster. Next, consider some questions of time. When? When do you need to act? How urgent is the situation? Are there any issues that must be handled now? And are there others that can wait? How long ago did the situation develop? And is it continuing to develop? Or are you primarily dealing with the aftermath at this point? And is it safe to act? Always ask that and ask that ongoingly, not just before you run into the burning building, but while you're in the burning building and while you're standing near the burning building. Ask yourself frequently, is this still safe? You run into a burning building, do you know if the propane tanks around the back are attached? Do you know if they're on fire? Think about what you do if you can. 
On the other hand, if there is an active threat present and you can identify the cause, for instance, a sparking power line setting fires, a person engaged in violence, a levee breach causing floodwaters that would otherwise be held back, then this is useful information, especially if it can be communicated to responders. Considering impacts helps you to identify the results of the disaster. Are people being hurt? Are situations likely to cause injury, even if none has occurred yet? Do not overfocus on the dramatic. For example, a small head wound can look very dramatic in terms of bleeding. Somebody who's not really bleeding may have eternal liver damage and may be dying right in front of you, but it's quiet and calm and not bothering you too much. But the dude with the head that's bleeding every mess, screaming and like this, but is actually in no particular danger. But remember, Reevaluate all the time. Am I safe being here? Am I safe doing this? Don't just do that evaluation once. Keep doing it. Your safety, your survival is the most important thing in any disaster scenario. And all of this leads to the cumulative question, how? With all of this information, how will you respond? To help guide the how, the response, we'll borrow another page from Professional Emergency Management Decision Making by having an orderly process for thinking about what to do. After making the size up, the next step is to develop objectives. That is, what needs to be accomplished, by whom, and when. Fix the disaster, or make things better, are just too broad. So is surviving, but in some cases that might be just all you've got. Survival, life and death, near death experience, all of that stuff, all of the stuff you've prepped, all the gear you've got, has gone. It's about surviving the now. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. You can't always do things in a logical and safe manner. You can't always do the right thing. If you're about to die, you're going to react very differently than if you're sitting down 10 miles away from a plane crash. Objectives should reflect the priorities that emergency managers know by the acronym LIP. L for life safety, I for incident stabilization, meaning addressing the cause of the incident when possible, and P for property preservation. Now this is the weakness of a cost like this and from my point of view I understand why it's there. They're assuming that this event is not transnational and that it is not ongoing and that it is not deteriorating. It's been done, needs a response, we can tidy it up, we can survive it, we can fix it, we can then prep and build for the next one. A good example of this is nuclear war. Responding and using LIP means that very quickly there's no resources left and you can't get any more resources. You've used them all up and that's something you're going to have to take on board. Depending on the scenario, you can't just use pre-existing ideas, pre-existing plans and throw what you have at that problem in the here and now and ignore the fact that today is the day before tomorrow. Tomorrow will always come whether you're alive or not. So don't just act on what they're saying on this type of a video or in your training courses or however you get information. Be very cautious about using any equipment and putting yourself at any risk in an ongoing long duration event of severity. You've got to really think seriously. I don't have a million antibiotic tablets. I have 25 or I have 50 or I have 200. How many are you going to give out to people before you have none for yourself and your own family? I'm not talking about hoarding, I'm not talking about ignoring other people. You've got to be very specifically aware that just using tools without thinking, without reevaluating, isn't a good idea. A size up and identification of objectives happened on flight 1549. Of course, the timeline was so short that both were done very quickly and were not recorded on a command board, but the process was still there. Transcripts from cockpit conversations showed that the captain and first officer reviewed the instrument panel and continued monitoring the status of the aircraft and the engines to determine the extent of the crisis. After this initial size up, they continued to maintain situational awareness of factors such as airspeed and rate of descent and how that corresponded to the airfields that air traffic controllers proposed for landing. The objective was to safely land the aircraft and once they determined it would be a water landing to ensure that all passengers were safely evacuated. Options for landing at airports were rejected as unrealistic, leaving the water landing as the only viable solution. This objective prioritized life safety by choosing the approach with the greatest survivability. Once the aircraft had landed in the water, attention could turn to objectives for rescue, 
including getting survivors out of the aircraft and then off the wings of the aircraft, providing necessary medical treatment, assisting with family reunification, and more. That's it for me. Stay tuned for next week, the end of chapter lecture four. Absolutely cool one. Talk about the hero complex, talk about going rogue, and a bunch of other really interesting information. So, toodles, grab a vegan coffee. This has been a 2021 Wolfie Terrier production.